sure, but we've seen them do it 50 times or more in one bounce. Hey, Grandpa, look at that one! Arthur, row two, frame 27. Got it. Ann, what's that called? Lob tailing. Mark that down, Arthur. Listen to the noise they make with their flute. We don't know why they do that either. Are they mad at us? That's a good question. It's one that might interest not only a young student like Rachel, but also a marine biologist like Anne. Science begins with good questions, and effective science instruction starts with a student's curiosity. As it happens, nobody knows the answer to Rachel's question. Scientists and young people have many interesting questions about whales, but very few answers. For the beginning science student, the message is encouraging. Science is not just completed history to be committed to memory, but an ongoing process of discovery. My name is Sam Gibbon. I'm director of the Bank Street College Project in Science and Mathematics. The scene you just watched is from The Voyage of the Mimi, a 26-part TV series produced for the project under a contract with the U.S. Department of Education. The TV series and the classroom materials that accompany it are the products of a collaboration between a private college of education, an agency of the federal government, and a major publisher. The Bank Street Project began in the climate of growing national concern about the state of science and math education. In response to that concern, we've developed materials to help teachers in the upper elementary and early secondary grades present an integrated set of science and math concepts to their students. We set out to combine the diverse strengths of three media, TV, print, and microcomputers, into a coherent package of learning materials. The television program allowed us to bring into the classroom a fascinating and otherwise inaccessible part of the real world, whales. It also permitted us to show some attractive, non-stereotypic images of scientists at work and a group of competent, curious young people engaged enthusiastically in their investigations. The Voyage of the Mimi combines a serialized science adventure story with a series of documentary expeditions to a variety of places where real science is done. The dramatic episodes follow the adventures of two scientists, their three young assistants, a sea captain, and the captain's 11-year-old grandson on a six-week mission to study humpback whales off the coast of New England. The story opens with the captain and crew boarding the Mimi, a 72-foot catch equipped as a research vessel. As the voyage begins, the inexperienced young crew struggles to gain their sea legs and learn the mysterious ways of sail. I got one over here. It's by the blow. At the same time, they start to develop their scientific skills. They locate and observe the humpbacks, conduct census studies, measure the ocean's temperature. Now, CT. And use a special suction cup radio transmitter to tag and track an individual whale. They follow the whale into a severe storm. Mimi is badly damaged and they must beach her for emergency repairs on a deserted island. How are we gonna get out of here? The ship's radio is a shot. There's no way we can get help. And the captain is sick. The boat is in no shape to sail and we haven't got enough food. What are we gonna do? We're gonna take things one at a time, just like we've been doing. To survive on the island, the crew members must use their ingenuity and exercise their practical science skills. This is body temperature is too low. We have to get it back up. They save the captain from hypothermia. They build a solar still as a source of fresh water. They forage for food, and they locate materials to use in repairing the ship. Each dramatic episode is followed by a 15-minute documentary expedition that expands upon the science and math themes presented in the episode. To give you a brief taste of these expeditions, here's Ben Affleck, the actor who plays the captain's grandson in The Voyage of the Mimi. After each episode in The Voyage of the Mimi, Mark Graham, who plays the role of Arthur, or Mary Tanner, who plays Rachel, or I, will go out on an expedition. Each of us will be visiting some exciting places, from the bottom of a bay off Cape Cod to the top of the highest mountain in the Northeast. From a school for boat builders to a college for the deaf, from an experimental farm to an Arctic test chamber. I hope you'll come with us. 
The project has developed a variety of print and software materials that build on the science and math topics presented in the TV series. To begin with, a student guide to the series and an accompanying overview teacher's guide depict each episode and suggest classroom activities to extend the concepts in the programs. Additional materials are grouped into four learning modules, maps and navigation, whales and their environment, an introduction to computing, and a unit on ecosystems. Each module includes a teacher guide, a student workbook, and microcomputer software. The print and computer materials allow a teacher to take immediate advantage of the interest kindled in their students by the TV series. Class, today we're going to watch a tape on Whale Watch. This documentary goes along with episode two that we saw the other day. Alita Scott teaches fifth grade at the Ridge School in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Her students are about to watch a documentary expedition in which actor Mark Graham visits the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Massachusetts. There, Mark learns about the two major types of whales, toothed whales and baleen whales. Marine biologist Stormy Mayo shows Mark how baleen works. So as the whale squeezes the water out, uh, from the inside to the out, the, uh, the water squeezed through this net, and all the small fish and whatever are trapped on this hairy material. This is the curtain-like strainer is called baleen, and the whales that have it are called baleen whales. The biggest baleen whale is the blue whale. It's not only the biggest of all the whales, it's the biggest animal ever to live on Earth, much larger even than the dinosaurs. One of the weirdest toothed whales is my favorite, the narwhal. The male has a six to nine foot tusk sticking out of his upper lip. Believe it or not, it's really his left front tooth. It makes it look like a unicorn to me. Would you please open your books to page 28? This is a summary, more or less, of the documentary that you just watched. Note some of the pictures and see if you recognize any of the whales that they showed on the documentary. Can anyone tell me what whale that is? It's a blue whale. It's a blue whale. Is a blue whale a tooth whale or a baleen whale? Jennifer? A baleen whale. A baleen whale. Ridge School Principal Don Mayako. The uh, usability of the uh, materials is high in a public school because they're so easily integrated with other areas. For instance, our science program happens to deal with environments and studying the whales is tailor-made for that. I have an experiment here that I would like for you to participate in. I have a pan of water and I have pepper. The project's print materials include instructions for classroom activities and experiments to follow each program in the television series. This follow-up activity to the Whale Watch expedition helps students see how baleen works. The pepper represents plankton. John, Chris, Jennifer. The student's fingers substitute for the teeth of a toothed whale. OK, now can I have one student come up and use the comb just to go from one side to the other and see how much, or if any, pepper clings to the comb? Andrew? The comb represents the baleen. Just, just one way this way to this way and then take it out. Okay, now let's show this to the group. Look at your fingers. How much pepper do you have on your fingers? Is it a lot, small amount? Which has the most pepper? Teresa? The comb. The comb. What do you think? Which way is more efficient? Ryan? The students the I piece. was working with yes. were quite interested and they wanted to find out more information about the subject. In addition to activities that relate to the individual television programs, the project has developed four learning modules arising from broader themes in the series. One of the four modules, Maps and Navigation, includes print materials and computer activities that help teach basic map skills. At Intermediate School 229 in the Bronx, New York, Peggy Andrioskis is showing her class the third episode of the drama. Ramon! Ramon! Get the sails down fast and get the anchor ready. What's wrong? We've got electrical problems. <laughs> Instruments are all misreading. We've been going faster than this thing says. Further than I wanted. On the shores? Will the ship fix up? It's possible. 
I'll get a fix with the RDF to find out. Won't that be wrong, too? No. It's got its own batteries. What's wrong? Well, we're just a little lost, that's all. Lost? You feeling well enough to help? Sure, better get us found. This is a radio direction finder. You tune in a radio beacon and the antenna tells you what direction it's in. You hear how that signal gets loud and soft as I rotate the unit? Uh-huh. When the signal is weakest, it means that this part, the antenna, is pointing directly at the beacon. This bearing is 285 degrees. I'm gonna go below and tune in a different beacon. You rotate that unit until the signal gets weakest, then read the bearing from the compass on the top. You got it? I think so. I mean, I know so. There's the second beacon. That's good, Arthur. What's that bearing? Three, three, four. Three, three, four, Grandpa. the bearing to the first beacon, 285. This is the one you just gave me, 334. Where they intersect is our position, right there on George's shoals. That's good. No, that's bad. Out of the way. Did Captain Granville do a better job at explaining some of those things to you than I did? Is Nikon? Yeah. Was it helpful to see the radio direction finder aboard the ship? Right. Yeah. So that you understand a little better what we've been doing with the charts and the map. The program provides a dramatic context for Peggy's lesson. Longitude. It's longitude, good. The students use latitude and longitude to locate a shipwreck. Where do you think the shipwreck was? How many degrees of latitude? Around 30. Around 30? Mm -hmm. Is it gonna be exactly something, maybe? Exactly. Was it Exactly, was it 37 degrees, 30 minutes? Yeah. Okay, place your ruler going across. Now, Lizette doesn't have it in front of her, so you're going to have to help her by letting her know about the latitude. No, about the longitude. Natali. 65 degrees. Exactly. OK. Yeah. I'll take your ruler. Would you draw a shipwreck for me, please? Yeah. Looks good. Thank you. I looked at it from a math perspective. Okay. When I first saw the longitude and the latitude, the only thing I thought of is plotting points on coordinate planes. So first I taught plotting points, because that's what I'm comfortable with. Then I brought in a chart that would have longitude and latitude, and I made the transition with them. OK, we can use the ruler if you'd like. I know that I have difficulty coming up with scenarios that they're interested in. Um, here they were interested, the and they spent a lot more time with the charting and the lines. They didn't give up. They wanted it to work out, and they were going to stay with me until it did. The software in the Maps and Navigation module embodies these same concepts. Alita Scott's class is playing Pirate's Gold. In this game, students use latitude and longitude to locate a sunken treasure. First-time players can request step-by-step instructions. Well, which way is 26 degrees, 50 minutes? Latitude. Group, help her. Teresa, do you know? Why don't you go down south? Well, try and see what happens. Now, Ask your group. Yeah, you Should go she go up? Okay. Now you got a dot. Now press D. What do you think? Will they find the treasure? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Found the treasure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Found wow. the treasure. Wow. Congratulations. Wow. Your diver has brought back 100 doubloons. Do you want to play? Again. Yes. How about a different player? Different group. Okay. The clarity on the software was excellent. The instructions were done quite well, and it was very easy for the students to understand the instructions. Uh, the tutorial part of it was excellent. As a principal, I'm interested in 
in materials for the computers, which do three things, which drill on basic skills and basic activities, and which also uh, give children a lot of new knowledge to learn and a lot of new subject matter, but which also give them problems to solve and engage them at higher cognitive levels. And these materials seem to do that. The fishing quota. Pirate's Gold is one of the three games that prepare students for the main piece of software in the module, Rescue Mission. Rescue Mission is a simulation game in which teams of students use simulated navigation instruments and race to rescue a whale trapped in the net of a fishing trawler. We need direction finder, trawler location. They determine their location by taking bearings to beacons with a simulated radio direction finder, the same instrument used by Captain Granville in the television program. 350. 350. 350. And 170. They move to their desk to plot the position on their chart. Should be right there. And should be right about here. Okay, now we put this over. Can you hold that other ruler? To make sure it goes to the first beacon and parallel so we can get. Eight. The first direction to the Thank first you. beacon. Do think that's equal? Or parallel? Yeah. Yeah, or should it be like that? That's equal. Okay. Yeah. okay, now that's equal. Now we gotta do the same thing. Basically the same thing. But it's better to be more accurate. So okay. Right. Yeah. So we can go right. less. Yeah, and the uh, wheel should be right around there, and we're right there. You're never going to have enough computers, or at least I'm never going to have enough computers around um, that I'm going to be able to put everybody on a computer at one time. No matter what material I'm using, I'm always going to have to work in groups. We had to take turns using the computer one day on, one day off. The materials in the books related right back to the computer material so the kids understood they were supposed to do work in their books. They were pretty, uh, the colors were nice, the stories were interesting. They found the exercises fun. It wasn't a drudgery. Back at the computer, the whale is about to be rescued. Motor. You gotta put the motor now. And to win, of course, we need the binoculars. And uh, we're looking towards 341 degrees. 341. Try 340. I know. Right there. Follow. Wait. Uh, how far five are we for two. Five. Five. Five for one, because we're too close. It'll go, go fast. We can still stop. But it'll go too fast. Yeah. All right. Ready? Yep. <coughs> there it is. No. Now. Here's binoculars. Got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. I was very impressed that they were able to think ahead nine steps into the strategy to be sure that they were going to win. I think they should walk away with better problem solving skills. The project's materials use one inherently interesting piece of the natural world, whales, as the entry point for studying a rich variety of science and math topics. Biology and oceanography, of course, but also physics, geography, and mathematics. The choice of whales came out of research conducted by the Children's Television Workshop, which told us that young people in our target age group are fascinated by these largest animals on Earth. Whales are a favorite subject with both boys and girls, and with children from a wide variety of backgrounds. Our own project research staff has undertaken two areas of responsibility making sure that the science presented in the project's materials is reliable and accurate, and conducting a series of studies with students and teachers as the materials were being developed to maximize their success in the classroom. The person responsible for coordinating our formative research is Cynthia Char, head of the project's research team. We purposely sought out teachers who had computer experience as well as those who hadn't, and we were particularly interested in seeing that the materials seem to, to be able to address both groups of teachers. Actually, Heather, do you think we should go forward? I mean, um, check the distance. Yeah, I wish I could check the distance. 
okay. Another of the four yeah. learning modules, an introduction to computing, helps students understand how computers work, how they're used, and how they can be programmed. The module includes a series of turtle graphics games, which provide a graduated introduction to simple programming. In this game, students enter commands in the logo language to move their boat close enough to a whale to identify it. Subsequent games introduce more advanced computing concepts. Snapshot. Which one? D. 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 It's gotta be D. D. Okay. So. Right. All right. Press return. Okay. Last one. Right okay. ninety. Right ninety. I'd say right eighty-five. Okay. Doodle mode allows students to use their developing programming skills in a less structured format to create their own graphic designs. It's a nice color of blue, actually. Yeah. Several different shades. He's turning out. The scientists on board the Mimi use their computer to plot the temperature of the ocean as a function of depth, essential information about the whale's physical environment. In the learning module called Whales and Their Environment, students can use the Bank Street Laboratory in much the same way to gather and graph data about the natural world. The laboratory comprises both hardware and software. With sensors connected to the computer, students collect information about light, temperature, and sound. The computer can display data in a variety of graphic formats. How about a clap? Try a clap, see what happens. Ah, there you go. The Bank Street Laboratory and the accompanying student and teacher texts help students learn some basic physics and at the same time become familiar with the formats and conventions of graphing. Hi, how are you? We know that teachers, not technologies, are the key agents of success in science instruction. The classroom climate created by the teacher is more powerful by far than any of our materials. The spirit of inquiry that delights in questions to which the answers are yet to be found is a wonderful contagion that can spread from the example of an enthusiastic teacher. We hope the Voyage of the Mimi can help teachers entice their students to the pleasures of science and math.